so good to be with you this evening. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be exceedingly, exceedingly glad in it. We thank you so much for taking time to spend uh, with us this evening as we dive into God's word. God's word is living seed. It's infallible seed. It's incorruptible seed. It's seed that cannot die. When God's word is planted in your hearts, the, the word of God says it will bring forth a harvest. I'm telling you right now, we're excited about just being with you tonight. And God has given us something to share with you as always. But my wife always says it always hits us first. And so the reason it hit us first is because we are partakers first of our fruits. Amen. Amen. So when we eat God's word, we just want to share the goodness with you that we found. So welcome. Get your notepads, get your iPads, get whatever you can that you use to take notes, because we have some scriptures to give to you that we hope will open up or illuminate God's word inside your heart. Amen. Amen. Good evening, CFC family. Welcome to Word Seed Wednesday. Um, and we're so delighted that you're here for those that are in the building and everyone that's viewing virtually. We're so honored that you have joined us tonight. And I want you to just, just you know, relax, get comfortable mm. so that you are in the place of receiving. Amen. Will you pray? I will. Father, we thank you for this glorious night that you've you graced us to see. We give you glory and honor because no one deserves it but you. Thank you. And Father, we thank you right now for every opportunity to 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 just break bread with your people, Father, in the name of Jesus. And Father, we just ask you right now, Holy Spirit, that you be our words, our actions, and our thoughts. We yield ourselves to you. We submit ourselves under your authority. You lead and guide us. You teach this Bible study. We're just vessels, and God, we want it to be done by you in the name of Jesus. So God, we thank you. We bless you. Set this atmosphere in the name of Jesus. We bind the work of the enemy because we know we have an adversary. But we thank you, God, that you've already overcome him, have already overcame him for us through Jesus. And God, we just give you glory and honor. We worship you this night in Jesus name. Amen. 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 So we started a series Sunday entitled Life. And we looked at the book of Ephesians, starting to go through the book of Ephesians and going through this book. We're not going to do it verse by verse, but we will do it chapter by chapter, all six chapters. But we'll skip around in each chapter as the Holy Spirit leads us, Mm -hmm. Uh, because in this book of Ephesians, we said Sunday, this is our faith constitution. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. As a matter of fact, one translation says the just shall live by his faith. God has given you and me, all of us, every believer, his faith as a free gift. And so we are to live this life by faith, not by our carnal senses of what we, our five senses, that's all it means, of what we can taste, see, feel, hear, smell, but to live by the faith knowing that it's already done. Amen. Everything Amen. that God has given us in life, in this life, in this new dispensation of grace has already been done. Amen. Since it's already been done, then we have to learn how by the Holy Spirit to bring it out of the unseen realm yes. into our everyday ordinary life. Amen. Because it does you and me no good Amen. to stay in the unseen realm. Amen. God has given it to us, the free gift, but we have to bring it into our everyday use so that we can use it in this natural You know, one of the biggest tricks of the enemy is to keep us from doing that Hmm. or to cause us to feel like we don't have the ability to do that. So we never even attempt to do it. Right. Because his whole thing is to keep us defeated. Well, I want you to know that we're not defeated. You're not defeated. And God, the Holy Spirit just wants to teach us how to access everything that he has made available to us so that we can bring it from the supernatural into our natural, into our everyday ordinary lives. Amen. Amen. Because God wants us to be successful in our everyday ordinary lives. That's why he sent us the Holy Spirit. He knew we needed help. And, you know, when you think about that, he's such a loving God. He He sent us a partner who is really in the forefront, who's really much greater than we are, who knows how to do what we don't know how to do. All he wants us to do is depend on him, rely, come to him, and I promise you he will show us he's going to lead and guide us because that's what he said he would do for us. Amen? It's amazing she mentioned the helper, uh, the Holy Spirit, the helper. That word help in, in the New Covenant means he's one who comes alongside to help. He doesn't consume you or overtake you to make you do anything. He's a perfect gentleman, but he comes alongside to help. And all we do is cooperate with him so that what we desire in life shows up in our life. Now, it's interesting that God said in his word that one thing that can be the biggest 
um, weapon that the enemy uses against his children is ignorance. He said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And so we want to make sure that we give you God's word, not Amen. our way, but Amen. God's way of doing things. Because once, once we submit ourselves to God, he comes, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us, Amen. to teach us, to guide us, to help us, to comfort us, to stand by us, to even intercede for us. And so we have to dispel a lot of ignorance through finding out what God says in his word as it pertains to new covenant believers. Remember, we've said this, the old covenant was for our learning. The new covenant is for our living. Amen. We are no longer bound to or to live by the old Mosaic law. The Bible says the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You know what's amazing? To, to you know, when, every time I hear my husband say that, I think about this: the law was never given to us, given to us anyway as Gentiles. That's right. It was given to the Jewish people. So when you think about that, it was never given to you. But, you know, we serve a God who's so loving that he wanted to adopt us in, and he did. Yes. But then he gave us something that was so much better and so much greater. Oh, my goodness. And until we see that and we embrace that, we will keep being defeated in a life or in a, in a land where he meant for us to be victors. He means for us to walk on everything that's unlike him. He, he means for us to be overcomers, overcomers and not just overcome, but I mean, we'd be great in our overcoming. Amen. You know, I was thinking that she was talking uh, even before she spoke this time. Um, as many know, I've been married before and that marriage did not work out. Not that we were bad people. Uh, we're both good people, but. I realize now I was trying to do marriage based on my own knowledge of mm -hmm. what marriage should be, Amen. and it failed. What am I saying? When I now do marriage with this beautiful lady, and I understand that God has already given us his way of doing marriage, uh -huh. when I take his fundamentals, when I take practice his principles. And when I take the word of God and try to do marriage that way, I see more bliss. I see more success yes. and more victories in my current marriage than Amen. I did before. Amen. Again, it doesn't mean that I was a bad person previously or she was a bad person previously. We were just trying to do marriage based on what we thought marriage should be like. But God has given us instructions in this book of Ephesians for every walk of life. Now, I want you to know that you serve the God of a second chance. Third and fourth. Amen. <laughs> He's an amazing God. Yes, he is. And, and I don't care what you've been told by somebody else. Mm. I want you to know he's the God of a second chance. Yes, he is. And let me tell you something. You know, I read in the scripture where it says he, he removed the first to establish the second. Mm. So I want you to know that the God that you serve, no matter what happens or what has happened, God can make it better the second time around. Yes, he can. I want you to know that his, his plan for your life is to make it good in every area. Amen. So let's leave the past in the past That's and look where forward. Look, where he's taking us is much greater than what we've come from. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The past is where it should stay. That's where it should stay. Amen? That's history, right? Don't keep reliving no. it. Don't keep rehearsing it. Don't, Don't keep nurse talking it. about it right. to somebody else. Let that stay where it is and go forward. Because what he has for you that's in front of you is so great that when you tap into it, you're going to say, God, I see your goodness in this. And I rejoice because of what you're doing for me and in me. Amen. Because when we nurse and rehearse our past, it keeps us stuck right there. Amen. God with the grace, the too good to be true news, God gives you an installment and God gives you blessing upon blessing. It says grace upon grace, peace yeah. upon peace, gift upon gift. Mm -hmm. God is in the promotion business. Yes, he is. And yes, so when, he we, is. when we look at Ephesians, we started with chapter one on Sunday. And as a background, just by way of review, Ephesians is today present day Turkey. It was a very thriving city back during the time of the apostles. Oh, what did I say? Ephesians. I did that yeah, Sunday. Like, you know, the people. Ephesus, Ephesians. where we get the book of Ephesians from. <laughs> Thank you so much. I need help. Thank you, Jesus. Um, the, the city of Ephesus was a very thriving city. It is present day Turkey. And what's interesting is that it was a city of pagan worship. And they worshiped this goddess named, um, what was her name? Um, Emeritus? Yeah. And, and so they had silversmiths who would make trinkets and they would make little statuettes, if you will, of emeritus. And people would come from all over the world to buy these statuettes and these trinkets to worship them and celebrate this goddess. And then here comes Paul, the apostle of grace, who sat with Jesus for three years in the Arabian desert. And he's bringing in the too good to be true news. And he upset the apple cart when he came in. 
And he came in teaching grace to a bunch of pagans. And I got excited because I said, if pagans who were worshiping a pagan God can hear the too good to be true news of Jesus Christ and how he saves and how he redeems and how he gives you the second and third chance. And it transformed thousands upon thousands of people from paganism to Christianity. That's a God I can serve right Amen. there. And so Paul and his team of Timothy and Apollos and the, um, the, the um, apostle John, they, they upset this whole city and the people in the city who were making all this money got upset. They got bothered real bad. And so they bum rushed wow. one of Paul's uh, uh, sessions or crusades, if you will, or his teachings. And they started a riot and Paul had to be run out of town. He was run out of town. But they tried to do this because of something that we're going to talk about tonight. And it's envy. Hmm. I'm going to make a bold statement right now. I believe, doesn't mean I'm right, I just believe it. Every negative emotion from hatred to controlling women to um, racism to um, where they kidnap women and make them uh, sex slaves, all of any form of control or dominance like that comes from a place of envy, but the root of it is fear. Envy at its core is fear-based. So I was walking today. My wife um, took me um, to go walk, and she had to go do some other things. And I was in the woods, and I was having my prayer time, my devotion time, and God spoke some things to me that he wants me to share with you tonight. And then we'll go down and, and dive again into what he's saying, looking at Acts chapter, I think it's chapter 19 or 20, how envy even crept into what, the, what they were doing in Ephesus. Amen. Okay? I want you Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So God said this to me. He said, tell the people, don't be affected by the few. I said, God, you never told me that before. I said, don't be affected by the few. He said, exactly. He took me back to when Lucifer was in heaven. And he reminded me that only one third of the angels were kicked out of heaven with Lucifer. So that means two thirds of the angels were doing the right thing. Still and, serving the most high God. And what do we typically do? We focus on the few. We always focus on the few. And we have fear-based teaching based on the few. Mm -hmm. God said, look at the big picture. Mm -hmm. He said, you remember, and we're talking like this. He said, you remember when you were an administrator and you look, did trainings? I said, yeah, I, I remember. And we got data to back all this stuff. He said, there were only 6% of the people in the entire district wreaking havoc in the schools creating the, the mass suspensions. Said I said, people, the students. The students. <laughs> well, no teachers. The students. We couldn't suspend the teachers. We need them. But only 6% of the students mm -hmm. were wreaking havoc in schools. But what was publicized in the media and what was publicized in people's conversations was how bad the kids are, how just terrible the kids are. And a friend of mine said, wait a minute, Hans, look at this data. And so we start digging into the data if 6% are cutting up doing the wrong stuff, that tells me 94% are doing the right thing. When you get to flip the narrative and understand that God's goodness and grace is transforming people's lives, you see through different lenses. Amen. And that's Amen. what Paul was doing in, in, uh, in Ephesus, not Ephesians. He was doing it in Ephesus. <laughs> and he was causing people to see through a different lens that created a different narrative even about themselves. My God. Uh -huh. And so my wife said, you know what? It's the same today because we can encounter people who may not speak to you. or We, may, we can we can encounter people who we may deem as uh, whatever bad people or they're like this or they, they're like that. Well, I spoke to them. They didn't speak back to me. And so when I was walking, God said, you know, the people you speak to. I said, yes, Lord. He said, I said, because all of them don't speak to me. He said, that's the few. <laughs> Remember, don't focus on the few. don't focus on the few. He said, don't focus on the few. He said, look how many do speak to you. He said, celebrate that. Yes. 
Because what the enemy would do is deceive us to thinking that all of certain people are just like this, or all of certain people are like this, or all young people are bad. Oh, no, that devil's a liar. Because I believe God, through his grace, is moving throughout the land, and he's changing the hearts of people like he did uh, in Ephesus. Thank you, baby. Like he did in Ephesus. And the grace, the too-good-to-be-true news of God, is transforming Amen. people's hearts and transforming their minds. The Bible says it is the goodness of the Lord that causes one to repent. What is that? To change the way they think. Now, my husband, I don't think he put this in here, but I want him to pull it up. He sent out something this morning. We were watching uh, the news this morning, and they had the teacher, uh, I guess, of the year. Yes. And she, had a, she made a comment, or she has a, a comment that she uh, makes or lives by, <clears throat> which is so amazing. And I want, I want you to think about this. Let me find it. it. I'm going to find it. Holy Ghost, let me find that. Because remember, the the, the thing is, the Holy Spirit is to, he wants to do a mind change in every one of us. Let me tell you something about a mind change. We can have a mind change, but it's amazing how the enemy is always trying to take us back to where we were. So we need the word to remind us of where God wants to take us and where he, where, what he wants us to focus on. Because, you know, something happened this morning and my husband said, Wanda, don't let that mess up your whole day. Because we got in the car and I was kind of quiet. And I'm like, you know, and, and uh, of course the Holy Spirit spoke to me through him. saying, don't, don't let, you know, because we have a choice. We can either go with whatever the enemy is trying to feed us, whatever tries to, you know, we get up in the morning, okay, it's going to be a good day and then something happens and, you know, we can quickly just change. Well, I have I had a choice mm -hmm. not to succumb to that, but go on and enjoy my day and enjoy my husband. Amen. You found it? Yeah, I found it. The Holy Ghost right. gave it to me. Okay. Listen what it says. It says, every day, wake up looking for the good. Hmm. When you continue to look for the good, the good becomes better. The good becomes better. And the better becomes best. Now, it says, look. She said, look for look the good. Look for it. That's powerful. And we don't think about how just that frame of mind can transform our everyday living. That's right. Wake up looking for the good. You know, because you know when you wake up, the first thing the enemy is telling you is something bad anyway. You don't feel good. I don't feel like going over here. I don't feel like going to this job, dealing with these people. I just, you know, you know I don't even want to go to the grocery store and deal with them. They mean in the grocery store. So we've got to change the way we see things. Amen. So, so let's look at this. So <clears throat> go with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 19, 26 to 28, and then we'll launch into um, Ephesians chapter one, because I want to show you how envy was at the root of everything that upset the apple cart in Ephesus. If you go back even to the beginning where the first murder took place, envy was at the root of that. And we're going to see that envy really is, we really walk in fear, afraid that God won't do for us what he said or what he promised in his word. And so we become envious when we see um, certain people we think getting blessed and other, peoples are not, other people are not. I want to dispel um, an age-old colloquium in a lot of churches. But favor ain't fair. That's one of the biggest lies I ever heard. <laughs> and if we get blessed... We are like, well, faith ain't fair. Like God gave you something he didn't give to somebody else. My Bible tells me he's given us all things, now, everybody, oh all things. Now, let me tell you my problem with that statement. It makes, it's a statement to me that causes one to try and put themselves above another brother or sister. Absolutely. And when Jesus said that the world would know that you're my disciples because of the love you have one for another, and I want to see you do good. I want to see you have good. So I'm going to believe that God's going to grant you your desire and that that he has for you, you're going to come into it. And I, I don't want you not to. I want you to come into everything that he has for you. Why? We serve an amazing God who's lacking in nothing. So whatever you need, beloved, whatever you want, he has that and more. Amen? So I didn't give you the title of tonight, even though I said we were talking about the series on life. And God gave us the title, Low Grade Living. He wants us to get rid of low-grade living. Now, low-grade living has nothing to do with how much money you spend. Or how much money you have. Right. 
It's just the thing of walking in the love of God and not being envious of your brother and sister or anybody else. Because, see, when we talk about not walking in low-grade living, when we compare ourselves to somebody else, that's low-grade living. We act like because God did something for them that he's not going to do it for me. Now, the Bible says to um, provoke one another to love and good works. Mm -hmm. But even in that provoking, it's not supposed to take you to a place of envy. My wife taught me something years ago. Envy hits all of us. It does. But the key is, what do you do when it shows up on your doorstep? Mm -hmm. If you leave it there, let it take root. We're going to see tonight it can form bitterness. And envy can take you to a place quickly that you never, ever thought or suspected that you would find yourself there. So look at Eve, uh, Acts 19. Thank you. We'll start at verse 26 through 28 in the New Living Translation. We read this Sunday, but I think it's a set the stage as we go forward. Acts 19, 26 to 28, New Living Translation. But as you have seen and heard, this man Paul has persuaded many people that handmade gods aren't really gods at all. How many of you know that was an envy statement? Now, I want to tell you something, too. When it said that he has persuaded many people, <clears throat> I want you to know that the Holy Ghost in you wants you to persuade people. Yes, he does. Oh, my God. Not because of a fear-based gospel, mm -hmm. but you persuade them because you talk about how good this man named, named Jesus that you serve. Amen? Think about your most favorite teacher in school. Did they persuade you to be the best student because of how mean and controlling they were? Or because of the goodness you experienced just being around them? I went back yesterday or day before, and I said, Wanda, I can name all my good teachers that I had, starting in kindergarten with Miss Watt. Then from Miss Watt, I went to Miss Walker in the first grade. Then from Miss Walker, I went to Miss Watkins in the second grade. I skipped the third grade. Then <laughs> I skipped the fourth grade, too. Then I went to the fifth grade. I had this lady named Miss Gewen. Miss Gewen could play basketball, too. She was about six foot one, could just play that thing. Then I went to my seventh grade, and I was able to do that. But those teachers had an impact on me, yes. not because of how mean and controlling they were, but how they saw the good in me. And, and every time I went around them, goodness was a part of even their correction. That's how God is through the Holy Spirit yes, with us. Is. And he oh, wants yes, us to be is. with everybody we encounter. Yes, amen. So that's what persuaded these people. Paul came with this too good to be true news mm -hmm. that God died for you. God loves you. Even when you weren't lovely, God still loves you. And nothing that you can do can stop God from loving you. Mm -hmm. I think I said it Sunday. Mm -hmm. God doesn't love you anymore because of the good you do. You know, the goody good you try to do. He doesn't love you anymore because of that. He loves you because of his son. Amen. And he doesn't love you any less when you mess up. Amen. But as you have seen and heard, this man, Paul, has persuaded many people, you know, they, he, he, he persuaded people to stop buying our stuff. <laughs> look, look. And he's done this not only here in Ephesus, but throughout the entire province. So the grace of God spread like wildfire. Would you agree with that? It's doing it right now, too, in this, in this earth. Amen. 27 says, of course, I'm not just talking about the loss of public respect. For our business, I know what you're talking about, money too. I'm also concerned that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will lose its influence. That's a lie. And there, uh, and that Artemis, this magnificent goddess, worshipped throughout the province of Asia and all around the world, will be robbed of her great prestige. At this, their anger boiled, and they began shouting, Greatest Artemis of the Ephesians. Now, they were shouting this in the midst of one of Paul's meetings, but a riot ensued as a result of this. So they were envious at the success that grace was causing in the lives of people. That's why, let me tell you something. When God bless you, what people who are envious of you don't understand, it's just the grace of God in your yes. life. They don't understand grace yes. adds to your life. But you know what? Ooh, the Jesus. awesome thing is the grace of God wants to add to Come their on, life. Now. Oh, my God. What you say? That's all you've got to tell them. Look, the same God, the same, same God. grace you have access to. Amen. Hallelujah. Because, you know, I, when, when people can't explain how stuff is happening in your life, they create their own narrative. Oh, they do. Well, see, y'all must be slanging. Y'all must be doing. She out in that corner. She, she out there in that corner. She doing. So y'all doing something illegal. Y'all cheating on your taxes. Y'all doing something. No, it's the too good to be true news of God's super abounding favor in your life. Yes, just is. as a believer, just Amen. because you're a son and a daughter of the most high God. Amen. So they were envious at the grace that was causing uh, people's lives to change. So instead of recognizing God's grace in action, they focused their negative energy on Paul and his team. 
so don't worry about the haters. Mm -mm. Amen. They do what they do. They're going to do what they do. They hate. But you know, you serve a God. You know, when my husband was studying this and we were reading this, I, I read one part where God told Paul, go anyway. I, I mean, you know, Paul was like, Lord, they're going, they trying to kill me. They're coming <laughs> after me. He said, look, go anyway. I got you. Because I'm going to protect what you. What you say? So I'm, I'm going to tell you as a woman of God tonight, go anyway Ooh, and take the good news. Please. Amen. You have divine protection that's always with you. You remember when King David, um, uh, came out of the field from watching the sheep and he got into the palace and he was hanging out with Saul and they went to battle and David, you know, he's anointed by God and they came back after the victory and the women, and see, it messed, it messed some people up when the women get to hollering at you. And the women were shouting, you know, Saul has killed his thousands, but David, oh, David, David killed his tens of thousands. And the envy instantly hit Saul. Watch where envy pushed King Saul. King Saul, because of that evil spirit of envy, desired to kill David. Even though David was close, com a commandant, was that the word? Or close friends. That's a better word. See, that's a bougie word. Even though he was close friends with, with David, it didn't make any difference. He still wanted to kill David, even trying to kill him when he was asleep. Envy will drive you to a point that you don't realize the spirit that's operating in you, and it takes you to a place sometimes of no return. So because God is so gracious with spreading his love to all of us, there's no need for us to be envious. God is no respective person. He's no respective person. God says, he said it like this. You know, he said, I, but it rains on the just as well as the unjust. He, listen, God lavishly loves everybody. Yes, he does. And all we got to understand is the seed time and harvest principle. And in my time, oh, my harvest is coming. You know what, too? Let me tell you something. Envy causes us to be discontent mm. you know mm. y'all remember when i said one mm. time well lord why are you just didn't let me be born until you know like a bill gates why are you just said right and he said that that wasn't the lane for you i was like oh but then he, the holy you know the holy spirit is so loving Hallelujah. and he's such a teacher that when he began to break down to me my life and what God has purposed for me and let me stay want to mm. stay right there in your lane because that's good for you. And, you know, then I begin to repent. So Lord, forgive me. You know, I had a moment. I had a moment, but I'm back. I had a moment. But we all have moments. Yeah. But we can't allow the enemy to take us in a moment and create a lifestyle on a moment. And we mess up and we derail what God has called us to do because we're looking at something that God never even purposed for us to do. My Lord. Ephesians 1, chapter 3. Start a new King James Version. I think we did one and two Sunday. I'm not certain, uh, but we'll jump off with number three. Um, still looking at life and, and how God wants us to live. Don't live the low life. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he sent his son so we don't have to live the low Amen. life. I'm, I'm just telling you, you know, Ephesians chapter one, verse three, new King James Version. Blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. We did read this Sunday, past tense, so it's already done. Already. Has blessed mean that it's already done. We're, let me say this. We're not getting any more of God than we already have. So we can stop singing songs about, I want more, more, more of you, Lord. God has no more of himself to give us. He's given us all of him okay. in the form of the Holy Spirit because I, I, like the I like the song too, but it's cute. But let me tell you something. You don't have a baby Jesus living inside of you. No, you the Holy Spirit is a full-grown person living inside of you. Amen. you. You don't have a baby Jesus in the manger in you. You have the fullness of God. Thank you, Holy Ghost. You have the fullness of God himself living inside of you. Now, one might say, well, why is it that, you know, now I feel, you know, more empowered? Well, you're learning more about who he is and, how, yes. and that he's there and that he's already given you the ability that you need to do what he's called you to do. You're already an overcomer. Already. You're already blessed. What? You're already the healed. You're already prosperous. Amen. You're already victorious. You're already full of joy. Yes. You, you got it already. Every gift that God gave Jesus, he's given to you. Amen. He's given to me. And we just have to receive it by faith and just declare to bring it out of the unseen into the seen. Into the That's scene. why we said every day you wake up, you see the good in every day you, that you wake up. Mm -hmm. Every day on this side is a good day anyway. Mm -hmm. I heard somebody say it's good to be seen and not viewed. Amen. Blessed be the God, our father. Let's see, that's how you ought to wake up right there in the morning. Lord, I just, just blessed be the God, our father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in with every spiritual 
blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, envy shows up, since we all have this, it shows up when we don't believe we have this. But it comes as a result of comparing ourselves or our situations with somebody else's. Your car is fine until you look at somebody else's. <laughs> you can have a car paid for, running like a dime, but it may not have the latest headlights, or it may not be able to talk to you. <laughs> or, you know, we were in the yard the other day, and all of us, the, the, our grandchildren were riding their little scooters and stuff, and uh, one of our children's cars on the side of the road, and they took the phone out, and the car started rolling toward the... Uh, <laughs> toward the driveway. I said, that's nice. But I ain't got to have that right there. I'm good right where I am right now. I can crank my car and get in and it'll roll just like that one. With me behind the wheel. Yes, Lord. That's all right. I like that. Amen. So here's the definition of envy. Watch this. Envy is to feel dissatisfaction or unhappy because of what someone else has. Now, now I'm going to tell you something about this when we're talking about it. The key thing the Holy Ghost spoke to me is that we have to first ask the Holy Ghost to show us where we are. Because this is one of those areas where until the Holy Spirit shows you that's where you are or that you, there's an empty <clears throat> problem, we will be in denial about where we are. Amen. So we, I'm not going to say might need to, we need to ask him to show us where we are. Amen. You remember how... Um, because of the envy of Demetrius um, back in Ephesus and all of the silversmiths, they stormed Paul's meeting and started a riot. See, we, we don't see ourselves doing anything like that, but here's what we could possibly do based on envy. You can sow discord in your own family. Mm. Mm. You can sow discord on the job where you work. Do you know if there's a family issue you should go to the person. Period. And you all resolve the issue. May I give you some wisdom that's biblical, but it, it doesn't line, align with what the world says? The Bible says when you think somebody has an art against you, go to them. It didn't say text them. It didn't say write a letter. It didn't say, it didn't say send it by a pigeon. It says you go to them yourself, send it by sit pigeon. down, <laughs> and have a conversation with them because, see, when you sit down and have a conversation like that, you tend not to miss the understanding. Mm -hmm. now, you can miss oh the understanding any other way. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If you <clears> do <throat> that, and the person that you go and try and have this, get this understanding with, and you know, and you won't resolve to whatever the issue is, and they lie to you, they're in denial, there's nothing you can do about that. Not a thing. That's when you wipe the dust from your feet? That's right. Okay, Lord, I did what I'm supposed to do. That's I'm going right. to keep going. And then you begin to ask the Holy Spirit to heal your emotions so you don't stay tied to something that God has already set you free from. Amen. Amen. So once again, envy is to feel dissatisfaction or unhappy because of what someone else has. It is also to view someone else's success as a threat to your own success. Wait there, one more time. It is also to view someone else's success as a threat to your own success. God has a lot of success to go around. Now, you know, you know what? Let me tell you something. Y you might be really good at what you do, hmm. right? You might be really good at what you do, but I want to let you in on something. Somebody's coming along is a little bit better. Amen. That's just life. That's human nature. And, and I think as a believer, I don't think I know, God wants to grow us to the point where we celebrate the person or our successor. That's right. We celebrate them and let them know that we celebrate them. Because most of the time, what we go through or what we're doing at the moment, at the time, is, is just that. It's for a moment. It's a season. So our life, our lives are continually going through seasons. Mm. And the season that we're mm. in, mm. you let God let grow you in that season. But whenever that season is time to, for, for that season to pass, then you 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 gracefully pass the torch. You give even some wisdom to the person who's coming Ooh, behind Jesus. you. And because what you really want to do, you let the love of God cause you to want to see them take it further. You want them to go further. That takes humility. That's love. Ooh, Jesus. Oh, my God. That he wants us to exhibit in every area of our lives. When I was at the middle college at A&T, our, our school was just thriving. And uh, we had just gotten the National Blue Ribbon School. 
um, for the United States. And they wanted to take me out and send me into central office to train other administrators and with teachers. And they asked me a question. They said, Hans, who do you think should be your successor? And I gave him the person's name. And I said, as a matter of fact, I just had a conversation with him. I want to release him this year from teaching. Now, his test scores in my school, he was coming back getting all fours and threes. None of his kids got below a three. And I said, but I gave him my wife's words. I said, you're more than a teacher. I said, you're a leader. You're an administrator. And so we arranged for his education to be paid for so he didn't have to pay for it out of pocket. And I released him to go. And why? Because I saw the next generation who was coming. And that how he could take that school from where where God has allowed us to take it. I said, man, you're going to blow the roof off this school. And I'm sad to say that they didn't give it to him. So he left the entire district and went to halfway across the United States and is doing amazing yeah. things. But he's doing there. Woo, what he could have done right Amen. here. Amen. But God let me see let me in him. Let me tell you something. Oh, my God. What, what, whatever. A door closes. I want you to know, don't get faint hearted. Don't get faint hearted. Because the God that you serve is big enough to open another door, I'm baby. And when you, you walk through that one, it'll be much better than the one that was shut in your face. Why? Because our God is not, remember something, he's lacking in nothing. His blessings are, are, are intended to overtake you. I heard Tyler Perry say this, and he's born again, and this isn't scripture, but I just like it. He said, when one, when, when, when one door closes, go down the hall and knock on another one. Oh, I said, boy, I like that right there. See, you, you can't take no always as just a roadblock oh, yes. to keep you from moving forward. Sometimes no just may be a pause, but God's delays are never his denials. Sometimes no is because that door is it's, not the door you're the, supposed to be walking. Right. It's not big enough. That's, you need door number three. You need door number you three. You're knocking on door and number I'm two. Tell you something. Sometimes you know, that's a single door. What? Door number three is double doors. What you say, that's a double blessing. Mm. Amen. So envy and jealousy, we're going to wrap this up. Envy and jealousy, I found, has consequences. And I found this in the oh. scriptures. So I'm going to give you three. I found seven, but I'm going to give you three. These are consequences of envy and jealousy. Number one, consequence number one, envy lowers your standard by causing you to compare yourselves amongst yourselves. Pastor Harvey and I love jazz uh, music. We, we love this jazz called bebop. <clears throat> and one thing that was not a compliment in bebop music was that you sound like somebody else. <laughs> See, in today's music, well, they sound like so-and-so, or she sound like so-and-so. That wasn't a compliment when we played. And so you have to understand, God is such a God of authenticity and originality. He don't need you to be a cheap imitation of somebody else. Mm. Mm. So because it makes you compare yourselves amongst yourselves. Look at this. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. New Living Translation. Again, consequence number one of envy. It lowers your standard by causing you to compare yourselves amongst yourselves. I remember playing in this group and uh, this, it was a little top 40 band. It was, you know, I was going to school trying to make a, a hustle playing music on the weekend and I used to love this group called Mother's Finest out of Atlanta, Georgia. And I was just a cult follower of Mother's Finest. Wherever they went, I was there. And I would follow them. I'd go sit outside and look at their bus and just wait for them to get off the bus. I used to try to dress like the drum. I had them tight. Y'all remember Jordache jeans? I had them tight Jordache jeans. You couldn't hardly walk in them. And I had some cowboy boots, some suede cowboy boots, because he had them. And uh, it was a tight shirt, and I thought I, was, thought I was halfway buff back then, and had a little little bow tie. I used to wear that little bow tie, and I was playing with this little band, and I'm talking about, I was just slamming, and they didn't like it. They asked me one time, well, who do you play like? You don't play like nobody we've heard. And I said, well, I play like so-and-so with Mother's Finest. And um, they started laughing at me. And so I had a gig the following week, but they didn't know I had auditioned to play with this jazz trumpeter and uh, Donald Bird. And so... I got on the bus and they tried to clown me again. So they said, uh, Hans, we've been talking about you, the trumpet player. We've been talking about you, man. And you don't sound like the drummers we used to hearing around here. Uh, who, who you say you sound like? And I said, man, let me tell you something. This is my last gig. And they all looked at each other. What, what, what you mean? I said, well, I'm going to play with Donald Byrd. So this is my last gig. So y'all can just pack my stuff up when I leave. I'm taking home in my car when I get. So I'm saying, what am I saying? Listen, all you do is be the best you you can be and be led by the Holy Spirit. If you're different, 
that is okay. Amen. Because God takes your difference and he does some great stuff with yes, it. I'm telling you, every apostle I look at, they were different in their personalities. Amen. They were different in how they did stuff. Even the disciples were different. Yes. One of them will cuss you out and cut your ear off. One of them will <laughs> love you to death. I mean, they were just different in how they yes. did everything. So God appreciates. Why? Because God is the one who created your personality. Yes, he did. Yes, and he, he loves your personality. Amen. He gave it to you. Amen. Second Corinthians 10, 12. It says, oh, don't worry. We wouldn't dare say that we are as wonderful as these other men who tell you how important they are. Watch this. But they are only comparing themselves with each other, mm. using themselves as the standard of measure. How ignorant. How ignorant to mm. compare yourselves. You're better than comparing yourselves to somebody else. So notice how envy and jealousy can lead to arguments. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. More often than not, envy and jealousy will lead to contention, strife, and arguments between relationships. 1 Corinthians 3, 3, New Living Translation. For you are still controlled by your sinful nature. You are jealous. Now notice what your sinful nature is right here. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove that you are controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world? Mm. So God doesn't want us to control or uh, be controlled by people to the point where we um, uh, compare ourselves among among them. It's not it's nothing wrong with looking at someone as a standard of measure, but God can take you past what you see. Mm -hmm. But don't limit yourself to just comparing yourself to be a cheap imitation of somebody else. Here's consequence number two of envy. Envy brings bitterness. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Envy brings bitterness. <laughs> I don't know why you got all that house. It's just the two of y'all in there. Envy brings bitterness. I said it before. We might like running from room to room, playing cops and robbers. Mm -hmm. Look at 15. It says, look after each other. Isn't that something? Look at what we're supposed to do in the body of Christ. God says, I want you to look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Because in the grace of God is the fullness of everything we need, right? Amen. Amen. He says, watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Can I read it in the Amplified Classic? Watch this. Same passage, Hebrews 12, 15, Amplified Classic. Exercise foresight and be on the watch to look after one another. So it's hard to watch out for somebody when envy is present. You mess around and wish bad on somebody when envy is present. To see that no one falls back from and fails to secure God's grace, his unmerited favor and spiritual blessing. In order that no root of resentment, rancor, bitterness or hatred shoots forth and causes trouble and bitter torment. And the many become contaminated and defiled by it. What's the it? That envy. The many will become contaminated. Why? Because you'll draw people to yourself. Oh, yes, you And will. you'll contaminate them with the same yes. poisonous envy that's in you. You know, that's why wise people and people who know how to love and really don't let envy control them. Remember, <coughs> you said earlier, me. it hits all of us at some point in time. But what do we do with it when it comes? Yes. Mature people and people of love don't cause division by comparing people or call, trying to cause people to compare themselves amongst themselves. That's right. What do I mean by that? Uh, you don't go into a situation or a work environment, I don't care where it is, what you're doing, and tell somebody, well, you know, you're better at it than so-and-so is. And if you hear that, mm -hmm. then you respond to it in a way, you know, we're all good. I thank God for my part, but I thank God for their part, too. You've got to always know we've got to learn how to shut the enemy up when he starts to speak, because if not, that stuff will take root. Because let me tell you something, <laughs> beloved. Every human being loves applause. Amen. It's addicting, too. And, and we have to be honest. Well, you know, I really don't. I'm so humble. Don't tell that lie. You know, come on now. It's the Holy Spirit that yes. teaches us humility Ooh. and then keeps us in that place. Because he's always talking to us. Amen? I remember a friend of mine. I think everybody needs someone like this in their lives. That was a friend of mine. I call him a friend, but he was older than me. And he was a central office administrator when I was just an assistant principal. And he came by our school. And evidently, I was making some noise downtown as an assistant principal. Good noise. 
Thank you, Jesus. Yes, thank you. And so he came by and knocked on my door. And I happened to be in my office. And he came in, sat down, crossed his legs. And he was talking to me. He said, Hines, um, your name is spreading abroad uh, as an administrator. And he told me some other stuff. And I never forget this. And I had a name plate sitting on my desk. And it said, Assistant Principal Eric Hines. And he reached and turned that name plate around to me. He said, I want you to notice something. I always remember this. You have an A before your P. He said, the principal is across the hall. <laughs> You're the assistant principal. He said, every day you go home, you make that principal look good. Mm -hmm. That was a life lesson for me. Yes, it is. He said, it's not about mm -hmm. you. And, and I think everybody needs someone to be a check and balance in oh, your yes, life. Absolutely. Because when people sing your praises, baby, listen, it, it's, it's hard to reel that thing back in oh, it because it can be addicting to oh, you. Oh, yes, it is. That right there can be real addicting. Oh, it is. You know what I mean? It if you're is. honest. So look at this same passage in the, tr in the message, and we got one more. We're going home. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hebrews 12, 15 in the message. It says, make sure no one gets left out of God's generosity. That's humility right there. That's being your brother, your sister's keeper. Amen. Amen. I want good for you. I want good for me, but I want it for you too. I don't want to leave you out. And, and, you know, and we can't have false humility. Well, I just want you to get it. I don't want to be a part of it. Okay, shut that line, devil love, because you do. But the whole thing is that you include everybody else. Amen? That's why God causes us to be a blessing, so that you can be a blessing to others. Amen. He, he blesses us so we can be generous to others. Yes. He says, make sure no one gets left out of God's generosity. I like that. Keep a sharp eye out for weeds of bitterness. Let me read that again. Keep a sharp eye out. Keep a sharp eye out. For weeds of bitter discontent. Isn't that the word you used before? It says a thistle or two gone to seed can ruin a whole garden in no time. A thistle or two. It doesn't take a bunch of weeds or a bunch of people. It just takes one or two. And it says a thistle or two gone to seed. In other words, that bitterness is sown into the hearts of other people can ruin a whole garden in no time. That's powerful. That is so, powerful. so I don't want to be caught being envious and allowing bitterness to show up because what typically happens, bitter people want other bitter people around them. Oh, they do. Hurt people want to hurt people. Mm -hmm. You understand what we're saying? Birds of a feather will flock together. Mm -hmm. And so we have to understand that this is God's word. It does not lie. Mm -hmm. So here's the third consequence of envy. Envy brings confusion. James chapter 3, verse 16. Envy brings confusion. And I'm going to read it in the New King James Version and the Amplified Classic, and then we're going home. And it reads like this. For where envy and self-seeking exists, confusion and every evil thing are there. Mm. Where envy and self-seeking, that means you're in the center of the circle. You know, to, to sometimes to get rid of envy, you got to just... Celebrate somebody else, put them in a circle, and you stay on the outside. For where it's, it's self wherever self-seeking exists, confusion and every evil thing are there. Look at it in the Amplified Classic, James 3.16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder, unrest, rebellion, and every evil thing and morally degrading practice. Every evil thing and morally degrading practice. So what do we say before? God does not want us to live a low-grade life. The way to get rid of low-grade living is to get rid of envy. The thing is to acknowledge when it's there, Holy Spirit, I feel like this. Yeah. I need you to rid me of this because I want to be a blessing to everyone you let me encounter. But envy cannot be a part of the equation because that's not of the fruit of the Spirit. Listen, we love you so much. Thank you for joining us. Amen. Join us Sunday as we continue to go, go through um, Ephesians, Ephesians not right. Ephesus, as we continue <laughs> to go through Ephesians. And listen, we're excited about this because we're talking about now life. And we're going to cover every aspect of life because this is our faith constitution. We Amen. love you. Amen. I, I want you, I want to encourage the women to join us Saturday please, yes. for a sister circle. Yes. We will start at 11 o'clock, 11 a.m. I just I don't want you to... Uh, I want you to have some time to sleep in, but please join us. I'm really expecting us to have an awesome time. So please come fellowship. 
uh, eat. We're going to have a good time. Amen. Bring a friend. So please bring a friend. We're yeah. just looking forward to seeing you at Sister Circle. Amen. All is well with you. All is well. Good night. Good night.